happened. And um, so the next moment I am in this anesthetic like sleep or something like I can't see I can't I'm just I can't see I can barely move um, but I can still hear and I can feel and I feel I'm being carried I've got someone behind me with their arms under my armpits walking backwards with me and some one person has each of my legs and I'm being carried and they're like you know whispering amongst themselves it's real lighthearted, like giggling I can't really hear what they're saying until um you gotta go put me like lift me up and then I hear them start laughing and uh one of them says I can't get in there with her I said, get in where where am I going and um so they position, reposition around to where there's nothing behind my back and I get set into something, like something soft, like a, I don't know, it almost felt like a bean bag or something, but softer, like comfy. They set me into this and in the very next moment, I feel like a wet coat of just pain is put on me and just uncomfortable just physical feeling and I open my eyes and I have a sheet over my face and I'm in a chilled room with a guard standing outside of it and um, I actually had DOA sharpied on my arm along with um a bunch of times from all the times that they were trying to resuscitate me. I guess they have to, I don't know, keep, rec- I don't know, but there was Sharpie times written on my arms of all the resuscitation attempts, I guess, for when the actual um, paramedics or whoever got there. But it turns out that um, I wasn't even transported in an ambulance or a fire truck. I was actually transported in an ME fan and that really didn't hit me until later how close uh my life of sin almost destroyed my family um yeah and a lot has happened since i've been back um but i ripped the sheet off my face and i tried to scream but my mouth was so dry my throat was so dry i couldn't of course when the guard notices me um sorry when the guard notices me he his face turned white and I mean he didn't say anything he just took off running because there was a guard I guess dead or alive I'm still property of the state at the moment and um there was a guard standing outside of the refrigerated room in a hospital wasn't I I wasn't in a like freezer but it was a room that's kept like intensely cold and um so you so you were in the morgue then sounds I'd like step up from yeah. uh, i believe i was just pronounced i'm not sure uh see because i was in custody they don't give it they don't care about you they don't i i was really hard to get any kind of anything from anybody to them i was just a a dope head, you know, addict criminal. They didn't care anything I had to say. Um, I could barely get information as to how long I was dead, like what happened, how did they find me? There's still things that I never got answers to. Um, I've actually had contacted um, the hospitals after I got out getting records, just trying to figure out what happened to me because nobody would give me answers because they didn't, I was dehumanized, you know, there was no coming in there, rubbing on my head saying, you know, oh, thank, you know, thank the Lord you're alive. It's a miracle. It was, um, it's hard to explain. I was just dehumanized. Um, but at that moment I didn't care. (laughs) I had the joy of, 
you know, I had just experienced what I experienced. You know, there wasn't nothing on this earth that could get me down at that moment. But I will say this. Um, yeah, I made the choice to come back. Although, did I really, you know, I feel like he knew that's what was going to happen, you know. Um, so, although I made the choice. And that's because he had a plan for my life. You know, I feel like... Uh, I feel like the reason, besides the fact that, you know, God's grace is just overwhelming and that he loves all of us so incredibly much. Um, I feel like besides the fact of that, that me specifically, I feel like... I was given my life back. Um, just as proof. Now, I mean, you don't even have to believe what happened to me. I mean, I know there's going to be people that don't, and that's that's fine too. They will one day, though. <laughs> um, they will one day. Um, yeah, and and the te the testimony of the fact that this encounter with Jesus had on your life is that subsequent to that's, this you became that's the you proof. Were clean <laughs> and you were lived an entirely different life I mean you were you were the person that that you he would have been you be. had you not been violated and abused and and really fallen honestly into, uh, drugs. I think I think I'm I think I'm better than I would have been had all that had I never right. turned like that because um, I have such a strong sense of humility because I know what it's like to be at the bottom. You know, I know what it's like. So the compassion and the humility in me is so strong. And I feel like if I would have never, say if I would have just graduated college a, a virgin and went and had a family and just lived this perfect life, I feel like I would have taken God's grace for granted. I don't feel like I would be as close to God as I am had I not experienced what I did, you know? Yeah. No, I agree with you. I think we had talked about before this, how there's so many people at the effect, not just those who are the victims of abuse and drugs, but also um, the loved ones that go through it um, that are, you know, wanting their loved one or the person they care for, you know, the ones, the f best friend of yours, for example, who, you know, was seeing what was happening to you and while you were going through this horrendous abuse. There's something that happens when there's a violation, such as sexual abuse, that instills a, um, the corruption of the individual at their very soul that is is lasting until it can be healed through through Christ and that's what you went through and the compassion what strikes me about your account so much Tara is the compassion of Jesus you know he not he doesn't victimize the victims he doesn't the one victims of this world he doesn't look at them and say okay well I'm going to condemn you to hell because you were a victim of this world no he takes the victim, he knows, searches your heart. He knows Tara, you know, deep down inside, she longs for me. She longs to know what a loving father is. She longs to know, you know, what that is to have the, the, the total love, the consummate love. She wants that. And I am that. And, and I'm, and I, what I struck with your account, Tara, is that he, the roadmap that he showed you each time he just was asking and imploring you, come to me, come to me. I'm, I'm the one who can save you from all of this. I'm the one who can, can save you. And every single time he keeps going over and over and over and over, he never gives up. He you never wanna, gives um, up on you. You want to hear one of those uh, texts, what the moment was? Sure. This is one that, this is one that really, um, I don't know why this one stuck with me, but it did. I was about, well, the very first one that I, that I saw was, um, the, it was my parents' wedding. When I say my parents, I mean the man that raised me, the good Christian man that raised me that I found out wasn't my father. It was their, it was their wedding. And, um, you know, I got the knowledge that, yes, I know that you felt abandoned by your father, but 
he was placed in your life. Like that was me. Um, to instill, you know, there's good, just to dip my toe in the water of Christ when I was a child and um, to have that solid foundation to be able to go back to and parents that were, because he was really the Christ head of the family. He led the whole family to Christ and he was, he was it. So yeah, I felt like, oh, my real dad didn't want me and this and that, but really, um, really it was God that placed this man in my life, you know, to raise me. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. But um, the second one, um, I was uh, about 19 years old. I was heavily addicted, heavily addicted to crack cocaine, fast life, selling drugs. Um, I had actually, I was in a car that had gotten hijacked or carjacked and me i'm thinking i'm gonna go to these people and tell them it wasn't me and clear my name so they don't come after me um so i try you don't think clearly on drugs <laughs> obviously um so i'm in this hotel parking lot 20 years old 80 pounds soaking wet um trying to clear my name and i ended up getting uh getting beaten pretty severely uh by men, women, I mean, I got, I was beat with almost an inch of my life, and um, I really thought that I was going to die in that moment, and out of nowhere, um, the last man that was standing over me, uh, I was getting hit in the head with a pistol, like, I, I was about to lose consciousness, out of nowhere, and I remember in my head, I said, God, please help me, just a quick, you know, we say it mindlessly, I had no connection to God, but it's still just, I said, God, please help me. And I know where this man stops. And he grabs my hand and yanks me up. And he said, if you want to live, run. So I ran as best I could. You know, I was kind of injured, but I ran. And uh, I ran about two miles without stopping. So I hit a gas station. And I'm sitting out in front of this gas station just trying to, well, for one, catch my breath. I just ran two miles. And um, I see I didn't have any money. I didn't have a phone. I had nothing. And um, I see a taxi skirt. This is when taxis were still a thing. I see this taxi skirt into the into the parking lot. And um, he doesn't go to the gas pump. And he comes and parks right by me. And he walks right up to me um, like he was there for me. And... I said, you know, it's like, I'm here for you. I said, I didn't, I didn't call a cab. Um, I don't even have a phone. Like, how, what? He's like, I, I'm here for you. He's like, I, I had to come here. I, I needed to come here. I came here for you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Um, it was an older, like, a, he wasn't American. I don't know what he was. I don't want to sound <laughs> non-politically correct. Maybe he was Indian or something like that. And um, he said, I'm here for you. Where do you need to go? I said, I actually need to go, you know, a few miles away to uh, the suite that I'm staying in. And he said, okay, you know, get in. I'm here for you anyways. I was about to go home. Uh, I said, okay, I don't have any money. Like I said, he said, it's okay. It's, you know, just get in the car please I said you know you're not gonna hurt me are you he could tell I was injured he said, I think he said I'm not gonna harm you I think someone else has already done that um I'm here to help I said okay I didn't really have many choices so I got in his cab and um he took me to um where I was staying and when we got there he said can I walk you to your room I said, and I normally would have been like, no, but I was still scared, you know, because these people who had just done this to me, they knew where I was staying. Um, so I said, yeah, I guess. Uh, and I didn't get a bad feeling from this man. Yes, yeah, I guess you can walk me to my room. So he did. And when I got there, all I could think about was getting high. I just had all this happen to me. I had drugs in the room. I was just ready to go in there and get high, you know. And he said, 
can I come in for just a moment? I need to speak with you. And I, and he was talking like that. Like, I need to speak with you. I won't harm you. And I'm like, who talks like that in this day and age? Um, I was like, oh, no, you know, I really, I, I've had a long night. He's like, it's important. And I need, I, I have to speak with you. I said, okay. I said, just please don't hurt me. You know, I didn't feel like he was going to, but at that point, you know, all these things were happening in my life. I just, like he would have told me if he was going to hurt me. Um, so he comes in the, the room and I'm sitting on the bed, rifling through stuff, just looking for my, my drugs and um, trying to be sly though, because I didn't, I was still ashamed no matter how deeply addicted I was. And um, he grabs a Bible out of the nightstand. He grabs a Bible out of the nightstand and uh, he opens it and he starts reading scripture to me. And he said, you know, it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you're doing. None of this, you know, run to him, call out to him. He's calling out to you. I was on my drive home and God told me to pull off that somebody needed my help. And he started reading scripture to me, and um, I don't remember what it was, but um, I got angry. I got angry at this man, and I began to cuss him. I began to cuss him. I said, "Get out of my room! You know, you psycho." Um, I don't know what you're doing. Ain't nothing wrong with me. You know, the whole spill. Um, I just completely refused to humble myself. I just wanted to get high. I, and for some reason, I was almost fearful. But, I mean, he just, I was infuriated with rage. I started shoving him. I shoved this man out of my room. And um, he went to set the Bible on the bathroom sink on the way out I said take that crap with you and um he left and I sat in that hotel room that night um on the floor just didn't move all night just blood all over me I didn't shower anything just getting high and yes I was high but it was a different feeling there was a feeling in the room that I just couldn't quite put my finger on and um I just kept crying and not tears of sorrow or what had just happened to me, but tears of like change and hope. Like I can't even explain it. Now I know that that room is filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, even in that dark, dark moment of my life. Uh, and I mean, that, was, that feeling stayed in that room to the point where I moved rooms to get away from it. <laughs> mm. But when you're living in sin, you know, you don't, you don't want that. Yeah. And uh, that was one of the only markers that he gave me the sneak peek up was that moment in my life. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I should have looked at all of them, dang it. <laughs> but at least now I know how to recognize them. And now you are that person that came yeah. in and helped you that night. You're that person now on the, on the for other side. people, for other people. And you're doing it now. I mean, you're doing mm -hmm. it to others who are watching this and listening to this and people are, in my life. Yes. We're, um, I never thought about that. Yeah. It's happening right now. And, uh, we're going to, um, as I oftentimes say, this is the part that, uh, is perhaps the most important part because this, this, uh, account that, um, my sister is sharing with you has shared with you is, is for a purpose for a God ordained purpose. And you had asked earlier, Tara, maybe if some insight, um, you know, he was writing, Jesus was writing on the wall, you know, the, uh, when the birth of your your children, the babies who are in heaven today are not babies anymore. Uh, obviously, your daughter, um, full grown woman. But and there was one date there. I think you said, "Well, what is that about?" Um, um, that was the date that I had a 
had the abortion with the twin girls. Um, the ones that I carried the guilt for for so long. Um, and the first time I ever cried out to God in my life was over that. So, um, and not long after I did cry out for forgiveness, I found out that I was pregnant again with twins. So that was, um, that was a beautiful, it's a very important, special thing in my life. You know, every baby is special. Twins are double special. But twins, after a gift of twins, after you had done something like I had done, you know, I felt like that was God's way of saying, you know, I forgive you, you know, and it, like he has a tenfold in my life, everything that the enemy took from me, everything, it, he has just restored tenfold. And I mean, things I never thought possible. I, uh, I had this impression when you were saying that, that, that he wrote on the wall, uh, your birth date in the spirit that, you know, they had, they had been born into this world and, you know, Jesus spoke with Nicodemus, so unless you're born again, you know, Nicodemus thought, how can I be born? I've been born once. How can that happen? And he was talking about spiritually, their spiritual rebirth that, um, you know, for a baby, for, you know, innocent child going directly into uh, heaven and for you writing on the wall you were born yeah and when i my um, kingdom uh, that that day you know that you had um you truly had entered into his kingdom into your heart and the girl um, that was in that church house, one that I had grown up in church with, that was holding hands with me and my sister, um, I hadn't talked to her in 20 years, so I was real hesitant. I was like, she's going to think I'm crazy. I haven't even talked to her. Last time she heard, I was this, you know, drug addict. Like, she's probably not even going to want to talk to me. And I put it off for months after I got back. And um, finally, one day, it just got real heavy on me. So I and I actually walked out of work to send the message and I messaged her on Facebook and I, months later and I told her about my experience, not the whole thing, but the part that she was in. And I told her that she was in my near death experience and that through her, you know, it led me to Christ um, and saved my life. And, uh, she said, she messaged me, but it took her a while to message me back. She said, you know, uh, I didn't message you back sooner because I was, I was on my knees praying. She said, Tara, I prayed last night. And this girl had always, I mean, she was the music director's daughter. I had always looked up to her as a, it's a good person. She was a good Christian, strong Christian. Um, she said, Tara, I prayed last night to God and I said, you know, I've been struggling a lot spiritually. And I said, I don't even know if you're real anymore. What I'm doing all this for. She said, I was losing my faith. And I prayed to God last night. And I said, if you're real, prove it to me. Or this is the last time I'm praying. And she woke up the next day with my message. Mm, wow. Wow. So here I was thinking that she led me, that she strengthened me spiritually. When really, you know, God uses all of us and um, in crazy ways. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. He, he chooses, tends to even in the, Bi the Bible, if you look at the people he chose, those were the, uh, <clears throat> the least likely. They were the, in many cases, underdogs. Fallen. Those were the, like the, the you wouldn't cho choose somebody who was a murderer to bring the great news of Jesus Christ to the world, the Gentile world, you wouldn't choose uh, like an adulterer and a murderer, David, you know, to basically share the most, some of the most beautiful uh, in the Psalms uh, uh, record or heart, the heart of God, basically, all of those things. Um, I'm gonna ask you, um, Tara, to pray for those, um, 
I'm going to ask you a, a little bit differently to pray for those who need to receive Jesus as their Lord, but also to pray for those who have lost loved ones, either um, through a, abortion where they've aborted their baby, um, or the, and also for those who have lost their children or their loved ones to drugs, drug addiction, to be freed, freed of drug addiction, to be freed of the, the abuse or whatever caused this cycle of um, freedom and, and yeah. salvation. So would you do that for us, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Now? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Ready? I, I threw this on you there. I, I'll do it myself, but I think it's very powerful that you, the Lord has brought you. You're that that voice now on on the side of God's kingdom to speak freedom and uh, salvation to those in need of that today. Yes, sir. Dear Lord, we come to you today, God, and we we ask you, Lord, that you just just knock on the hearts of those that are still in bondage tonight, Lord, and that you just show them, God, that you have compassion, that you're not angry with them, Lord, that there's nothing, nothing, nothing that is too shameful to bring to you, God, nothing, that you are our friend, Lord, you are our deliverer, you are not here to, to condemn and to punish, God, you are here because you love us, and because you want to see us free, Lord, and accept you and your deliverance in Jesus' name. God, I pray for any woman out there tonight, Lord, that struggles with decisions that they have made in regards to their bodies, Lord. Abortions, um, even adoption, Lord, anything, God, that, that brings them guilt, Lord. I want them to just lean on you, Lord, and... You can just show them, Lord, like you did in my life, God, that you can make beauty from ashes. You can make beauty from ashes, Lord, and, and that you can forgive them. And that only a relationship with you, Lord, can fill that void in their hearts, Lord. And that nobody, nobody is too far away from you, God. That even if you, they make their bed in hell, Lord, you will be there. Um, Lord, uh, for anybody that watched today, Lord, and stirred their heart to their emotions, Lord, or I pray that you, you just touch their hearts, Lord, and show them the truth, Lord. I know that this experience, Lord, was not for just me, Lord, that it was for others to, as an example of your grace and your redemption, Lord. If there's anyone questioning, you know, my experience or what happened to me, Lord, I pray that you just, you pour the truth into their hearts, Lord, and that you use it as a doorway to open up to a relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. That was very powerful, Tara. And for those who would like to uh, reach Tara, um, you can go to randyk.org. There's a contact page. We'll make sure that your messages get to uh, Tara. Uh, for those of you who are on the premiere of this, uh, obviously we're having a, a live discussion. Um, and then um, feel free at any time. We'll be, um, uh, I, I trust, staying in touch with Tara so that, um, you know, for those who need ministering, uh, prayer, we have prayer meetings uh, that we'll, we're announcing on the site, randyk.org site. Um, and praying for those in deliverance and those involved in drugs and also through uh, our grief ministry headed by uh, Sherry Briggs. And, uh, you know, we have uh, are starting uh, in the near future a what I jokingly said to Tara, a small group, but it's a worldwide group, you know, where we're getting together real time and we're... Um, intimate group. How about that? An intimate group of... Uh, of the world, global intimate group. There we go. That's an oxymoron. But anyway, so thank you so much, Tara, for thank sharing. You. You've been very courageous. This is going to help so many people. 
And the great news is, is even if you don't meet